An ideal first stop on this water course is the odd, but important, little promontory known as the Spring Mound. We are, are, are probably less than 100 yards uh, from the Springs Preserve Common, from the trailhead. It's a very nice place to start because you can come to the top of the Spring Mound and you can kind of get a, you can kind of survey the valley around you. You can see the Springs Preserve uh, facilities, the buildings, the campus over here. You can see the Las Vegas Strip from up here. To the north and reaching out eastward is the historic watercourse of Las Vegas Creek that seems to well up out of some distant past. When you stand at the top of the Spring Mound and you look out across the springs, you can see the creek. You can see where the springs would be located because of the, the cottonwoods, because of the mesquite bosques. And it really does give that picture in your mind of uh, early Las Vegas. Nathan finds the Springs Preserve as ancient and fascinating as some of the oldest sites he's investigated in the Mediterranean or Near East. If we had the opportunity to take a core out of the center of the Spring Mound, we could date this going back probably about 12,000 years. But even scattered on the surface are signs of prehistoric human activity. In archaeological survey across the, across the Spring Mound here, we found projectile points that tell us that people were up here hunting animals. Uh, in the past. Over the centuries, a succession of distinct peoples, from the Patayans to the Puebloans and at last the pioneers, would have rested and reflected here by the springside. Well, the Paiute actually named this place uh, Bubbling Sand Spring, which means that there was so much water coming up from the ground that there was actually stirring up the sand in the sediment. Early settlers, when they would come here, they could go swimming in the springs and a man couldn't be submerged below his armpits. Such a flow rate gave the mound its characteristic shape and height. But in the 1960s, when overpumping of the aquifers caused springs all over the area to dry up, vegetation died and animals disappeared until recently. What we've tried to do here at the Springs Preserve is reconstruct uh, what the spring mound would have looked like. They started by recreating a spring pool and restoring the native plants so that now foxes, Roadrunners and other desert species are beginning to reappear. Here, because of the water and because of the water resource, there's so much life here. Uh, there's so much vegetation, there's so many animals. Just a few steps along one of the spring's many trails will bring you to a more recent Las Vegas water feature. And because of its large size, it's a very different configuration from the spring mound. So what we're looking at is actually a very deep cauldron pool rather than more of a, a shallower uh, pool that uh, has seep around it that accumulates uh, dust and sediment. This was the major source of water for the Las Vegas uh, town site originally. As the water engine that drove the growth of early Las Vegas, Big Springs attracted a lot of attention. At the Big Spring in 1911, the railroad, the Las Vegas Land and Water Company, encased the Big Spring in concrete. And uh, in 1917, they put a flat roof on the top of it. People would come out and they would have picnics on top of the flat roof of the Big Spring. Uh, they actually had dances, and square dances, on top of the, of the roof of the Big Spring. But the site also tempted some unwelcome visitors, and the flat roof was ineffective at ensuring good water quality. The burrows, the goats, the cattle, you know, all those animals that would have been, uh, would have been in the spring, uh, you know, you don't want to drink that. And so in 1926, they actually put a pitched roof uh, on the Big Spring house. And so to enclose the Big Spring was an important step in water technology. It was an important step in protecting the populace from water contamination. It's the remains of this later structure that are displayed and curated in their purposeful state of arrested decay. We're not necessarily here just to provide a, an experience that's artificial. We're here to provide a, an experience that's very real. And to raise some real questions about the tensions between protecting natural resources and developing them. We're looking at what was known as Reservoir Number no. 1. It was built by the Las Vegas Land and Water Company in 1929, once again to meet the demands of the growing uh, town site of uh, Las Vegas. And after we get the introduction of this, of this large reservoir, the water that would have gone directly into town now is now being stored in this reservoir. It's being treated in this reservoir before it is then pumped off to town. It was a distinctive landmark of the city's advancement until progress outpaced the water supply and changed its age-old course. 
when the water stops running in the, in the creek, there's a loss of this cultural identity, I think, that's associated with Las Vegas. Las Vegas being the meadows, once you stop having running water, I think that probably really affects kind of the senses of the people, the idea of the people that they're in a living landscape. Which is just the idea behind the Springs Preserve and the efforts of Nathan Harper, along with his colleagues, to understand this landscape and honor its origins. The site has changed immensely in the amount of vegetation that's, that's been brought back, um, the, the amount uh, of preservation that's going on now. And really, I think we are looking at the restored springs. We're looking at something that I think very closely resembles what early settlers would have seen, uh, what Paiutes and, and Patayans would have seen when they were living here.